Okay, while, while, we're, uh, while we're adjusting the mic, uh, let me just mention, it's, it's kind of a funny feeling being here today, uh, especially because I gather this is around graduation time, because it, it was 51 years ago this, this week that I, I graduated and planned to liberal arts at, at UT. So, so I'm back. <laughs> um, I'm going to chat today with you about sleep. I'm sort of like the you know the the opening band at a concert, and you're going to get to the real the real action on consciousness as you talk to Dr. with uh, Dr. Presti and uh, Dr. LaBerge. But I'd like to set the set the scene by talking about one of the states of consciousness, which is, as Dr. Short said, is sleep, and uh, talk about two or three illnesses of sleep, which I picked because they have some interesting features that bear on what it means to be conscious. And one of these is uh, insomnia, where there's a very interesting state in which people can physiologically be asleep and behaviorally be asleep, but in their minds uh, believe that they're awake. And the other one that we'll talk about... Um, okay. Keyboard here. He would know what to do. Yeah. yeah. You want me to use this too, or I don't think it's. We can. Wow. How's that? Okay. I'm gonna use my technique like we used to with Kinky Friedman. How's that be? Uh, and the second condition that I'll mention is narcolepsy because there's some interesting features in which dreamlike states. Um, intrude into consciousness in, in narcolepsy. Uh, so that's the reason that I selected those two illnesses to, to mention to you. Well, uh, what is sleep? Uh, certainly as a beginning, the thing that is that it's a, re a reversible and recurring period of behavioral inactivity. Now each of those words has some meaning. It, Reversible is what separates it from uh, coma or, or continuing anesthesia. Uh, the recurring is a, a key feature. Uh, it, if you look more broadly, just not the people, but animals too, that uh, usually occurs in a uh, specific place and a specific time. Uh, some of the qualities of it, of course, are decreased awareness of the environment but it's important to note that uh, when you're asleep, you still do have some awareness and ability to respond to the environment. Uh, you can certainly uh, filter information to decide what's important. To give you an exa uh, example, the classical story would be a young mother who, who can sleep through the noise of a truck driving by the house, but awakens immediately at the sound of, of a crying baby. Um, Another example would be uh, the, uh, a person is awakened by a much lower volume sound that's meaningful, for instance, a telephone ringing, than by a louder sound that doesn't have meaning, like an electronic tone. So we, we, we're not you know, a rock you know, when we sleep. We actually can deal with the environment. Um, another, I guess, very vivid example is a couple sleeping in bed. Uh, it's not unusual, for instance, if your partner digs her elbow into your side that you might move over a little bit or reshape the position that you're sleeping in. And in fact, there are videos of couples sleeping together that show that throughout the night, we, it's a kind of dance in which the two partners move, move together in many ways, none of which they consciously are aware of. Um, it is self-regulating, and we're going to talk about that later. What that means is that if you don't get enough of it, uh, when you're given an opportunity, you'll get more of it to make up for it. And that's the so-called homeostatic principle. Uh, it's found in all mammals. Uh, Sleep-like states go all the way down to small multicellular uh, organisms, although not single-cell organisms. 
and it's essential for life. And we know that because there have been studies of sleep-depriving rats, for instance, where if you deprive them for periods of pushing the area of two or three weeks, they, they ultimately will die. So in, in some fundamental sense, uh, sleep is necessary for life. Now, one good way to distinguish sleep or to explain sleep is distinguish it from anesthesia. Uh, in anesthesia, uh, even if you hear the words that the doctors use, they talk as if the patient is jumping into the water and then going deeper and deeper and then at some point leveling out and then coming up again, as you see this gentleman doing. Uh, and they'll use words like light and deep and so on. Well, that's anesthesia, that's not sleep. Sleep is more like this, where we, we move throughout the night in a rhythmically between a series of discrete uh, sleep stages with a very definite rhythm that lasts in the general area of about 90 minutes. And it's a very basic kind of body rhythm. Now, the way that we study all this is by doing a, a sleep recording or a polysomnogram. And the, in its basic form, there's three kinds of information that go into a sleep recording. The first is the EEG, or electroencephalogram, that measures a patient's brain waves, and more, more of that later. Uh, the second is the EOG, the electrooculogram, that measures the movements of the eyes. And that's important because it's the movements of the eyes that help define rapid eye movement or, or REM sleep. And again, we'll talk about that, and I'm sure Dr. LaBerish will be talking about that. And then finally, we measure mu muscle tone with an electromyogram or EMG. And that's usually measured by putting two electrodes underneath the chin to measure the muscles there, just as being representative of the muscles of the body. And that's very important because one of the other features of REM sleep, besides the eponymous rapid eye movements, is a general relaxation of virtually all the muscles of the body. Uh, fortunately, the diaphragm continues to work, so we continue to breathe. But most of the weight-bearing muscles of the body become very relaxed in REM. So the EOG and the EMG are ways that help us uh, recognize REM or, or dreaming sleep. <coughs> well, we showed you the slide before of the sleep stages, and this just shows uh, what the EEG or brain waves look like in uh, uh, the different stages. Uh, the very lightest kind of sleep is known as stage one, uh, has low amplitude, meaning low uh, energy uh, mixed frequency waves. As you go deeper into sleep, uh, and the, what most people consider the beginning of sleep is called stage two. And it's characterized by the brain waves slowing down to a basic, what they call a theta rhythm, and some very peculiar little bursts of activity, one called sleep spindles and one called K-complexes. When you get deeper asleep, you go into stages three and four, which are also called slow wave sleep. And they're characterized by deep, by large, slow, what are known as delta waves. And, and most people consider that the very deepest kind of sleep. Now, these stages don't occur at random. They, they occur in a very definite rhythm that you can sort of see on the chart on the right side. And you can see that a person goes off to sleep it goes into stages one, two, drops down into slow wave sleep, comes back up, has a little bit of a REM period, keeps repeating that process. And uh, that is known as the REM, non-REM cycle. And there's usually about five or six of those every night. Another thing to notice is that the REM is very short at the beginning of the night. That's those little blue things right on top. And the REM gets longer as the night goes on. And that's important because it helps the, uh, us study illnesses like depression. And we'll, we'll get to that later. Now, REM is defined as, uh, by its name, rapid eye movement. 
But it, actually, there's a whole world of physiological changes that occur during REM. Uh, the lady on, um, let's see, on your left uh, is shown to represent this general relaxation of all of the major weight-bearing muscles of the body. Uh, the fellow next to her is just to exemplify uh, the rapid eye movements. And incidentally, you know, these can, you can see these without a sleep study. In, in uh, infants and newborn, for instance, you can see the rapid eye movements uh, underneath the eyelids and uh, things like that. Now, the, the young, young lady in the middle is to make the point that during REM sleep, you lose control of body temperature. So you become, in effect, uh, you know, like a cold-blooded animal. You can no longer, if uh, the room gets too hot, you don't sweat. If the room gets too cold, you don't shiver, and so on. And the fancy name for that is poacolothermic. Um, the lady on your far right is to make the point that during REM sleep, respiration and blood pressure become very irregular. And the fellow second to your right is to make the point uh, of this conference, which is that most dreaming, as we usually speak of it, occurs during REM sleep. And of course, it's a lot more complicated than that. There are, are uh, some kinds of dreams in the rest of sleep, so-called non-REM sleep. Uh, traditionally, the dreams in REM are thought to um, uh, have more of a narrative and a storyline, to be more visual, to be more emotional. And that, and that, in general, is true. The things in non-REM sleep are more logical and goal-directed. Uh, it's, it's, I suspect some of the other speakers today will get into this, so I, I won't. But it, it turns out it's not that simple that, that some dreams in non-REM sleep have all the characteristics of REM sleep, particularly the non-REM sleeps earlier before the first REM period, which sort of ruins this beautiful classification. But uh, that's another story. Um, again, this is just to make the point that the, rev, the red bars, which represent REM sleep, are very short at the beginning of the night and get longer as the night goes on. And that's why a, a lot of dreaming, if not most dreaming, tends to occur you know, toward the next morning. Now, I mentioned before that sleep is, is self-regulating. It actually uh, is under the control of two powerful forces. And the first of these is the so-called homeostatic principle. And that's the one that we mentioned earlier, which is just simply that if you're deprived of sleep or don't get enough sleep, the next time you get an opportunity, you'll sleep excessively as if trying to make up for it. And that's home sleep homeostasis. And that's represented by the orange uh, arrows at the top of the graph. And the second principle that controls sleep is the circadian principle, because there's a powerful body clock in the part of the brain known as the hypothalamus that sends out a signal uh, telling uh, whether it's light or dark out and about what time it is. So it's a complex interaction of these two principles that results in whether or not we, we are awake or asleep. Now, all of these things like the homeostatic and the circadian principle operate on a body which is already pre-programmed for a lot of issues about sleep because of uh, a person's age. And next three or four slides are just to make the point a little bit about how sleep has changed by age. And let me tell you that um, I made this slide when I was about 30. And I've sort of followed it along. Uh, I'm not sure, being 71, I'm not absolutely sure I'm thrilled with the picture of 75. <laughs> and and uh, what's worse is before this talk, Dr. Schwartz informed me that we're probably going to be doing this for another 20 years. So I, I may have to add another segment onto the. Looks pretty accurate to me. Looks pretty accurate? <laughs> there you go. But the thing. <laughs> Excuse me. The thing to notice is that 
The sleep in a newborn is up to 16 hours out of the 24. And unfortunately, um, as, as uh, in fact, some folks in the audience can probably certify to us that that 16 hours is uh, distributed almost randomly around the clock. And it's only until you get up closer to a year that it becomes you know, clearly confined to nighttime. But in any event, the total amount of sleep declines uh, uh, when you get into the teenage years. It sort of stabilizes and stays about the same, and not declining again until uh, older age. Now, stage four, or slow wave sleep, is super high in the newborn and young children, and then declines in a curve across the lifetime. And some people think that uh, it's related to the density of the cells and the cortex of the brain, that it may be related to uh, issues of uh, the ability to absorb and take in new information. Uh, the number of awakenings you have during the night goes up across the lifetime from very few in childhood to very high in older age. Well, that's just sort of a general introduction to the, uh, the physiology of sleep. And what I'd like to do now with you is talk about two or three disease states. And uh, I'm, as I mentioned before, I, I, there's something like 30 or 40 fairly common, well-defined sleep disorders. I picked these because they, they each involve a medical disorder in which dreaming or dream sleep somehow uh, intrudes into consciousness. And the queen of those illnesses is, is one known as narcolepsy. Now, narcolepsy is an illness of extreme daytime sleepiness. Uh, it's a word that's often misused. Like, I, I saw something the other day that said that Winston Churchill was a narcoleptic, and of course he wasn't. What he was was a very sleepy man because he only slept about five hours a night and he took a lot of naps in the daytime. So it's a word that's misused a lot. But, nar but folks with narcolepsy fall asleep uh, at times and in situations where you couldn't believe somebody would fall asleep. So it's the, if you're a doctor in an office taking a history from a patient you suspect of narcolepsy, the way you phrase it is uh, not, you know, do you fall asleep during Dr. Mendelssohn's lectures, which is probably a very reasonable behavior, but rather, uh, you know, have you fallen asleep at ways that, you know, people tell family stories about how unusual it is. And, and, and usually a narcoleptic can tell plenty of those, and they'll, they'll fall asleep in the middle of an exciting, interesting conversation or movie. They'll uh, fall asleep in the middle of making love, which is not a great way to, to prolong a relationship. <laughs> and, and so you, you look for the, the inappropriateness of the sleep as, as the key. The next symptom they have is cataplexy. And cataplexy is a sudden loss of muscle tone uh, lasting a minute or less which can be mild, so mild that you just need to sit down, or it can be so catastrophic that you collapse to the ground. Uh, the key to the history of cataplexy is that it's brought on by emotion, by anger or laughter or any strong emotion. Uh, and it can be a very catastrophic thing. You know, people will you know, fall over 100% helpless uh, at your feet. Uh, the longer the episode goes, if it goes to a minute or two, they often begin to hallucinate, which is actually a kind of dreaming experience in a person who is physically helpless and collapsed, but actually conscious. Uh, and what it is, and all of these symptoms are when you think about it, is their intrusions of REM sleep into the conscious state or the borderline conscious state. Uh, now, cataplexy sounds really weird when I describe somebody just falling over, you know, when they start laughing. But try to remember, of course, that that's just an extreme case of a physiological process that we all have. 
Uh, and it's, it's so common that it's incorporated into our speech. You know, you'll say, uh, I had him rolling in the aisles, which meaning that when these people laughed, they, they lost muscle control. Or you can say, my mouth dropped open when she said that. Uh, these are all just ways of phrasing the common experience that we tend to lose control of the voluntary weight-bearing muscles at times of emotion. But in the illness cataplexy, this is a very, very extreme case of this normal physiologic reaction. Um, the next thing these folks have is sleep paralysis and hypnagogic hallucinations. And sleep paralysis is, again, a, a borderline state between waking and uh, sleep. And in this state, just as a person is drifting off to sleep, or just as they're slowly waking up in the morning, they find themselves paralyzed and unable to move. And uh, in some of them, they begin to hallucinate um, you know, vivid visual experiences, which are known as hypnagogic hallucinations. And these can be very frightening because the person is unable to move. And then after a minute or so, it resolves itself and they continue. Now, although this is a symptom of narcolepsy when it's seen in a package with excessive sleepiness and cataplexy, it too is a kind of normal behavior. And it's so universal that it's incorporated into folk legends and so on in many, many different cultures. Uh, uh, in uh, Greece, it's known as Moira or the, the Little Death. Uh, in kind of inner city, impoverished areas in the US, uh, I've heard it called the, the Witch Riding Ya. And uh, in uh, Scandinavia, it's, called, uh, it's referred to, I can't think of the phrase, but it, it means uh, a visit from the old hag, meaning an old you know, witch-like creature. So again, it's a uh, pathological form of a very normal and, in fact, universal human behavior. Now, narcolepsy is usually an illness that begins in the late teens and the 20s. And once you have it, it's an illness that you have for life. This just illustrates some of those points. And here's the sleep attack. And again, very inappropriately falling asleep when what looks like it's a pretty good party going on. Um, again, <coughs> sleep paralysis. You're just drifting off to sleep, and you're sort of half awake. Uh, you're not really asleep, but suddenly you find yourself completely unable to move. And uh, in longer ones, not only are you unable to move, but you begin to have vivid hallucinations. And uh, these, again, I, I chose this today because you can view hypnagogic hallucinations as being a kind of breakthrough of REM sleep, which has dreaming into a, a waking state. Um, the next illness I wanted to mention is sleep apnea. And the reason I, I mention it is it, it doesn't have the, uh, the consciousness issue so much, but it represents some of the qualities of REM sleep that we talked about. So just briefly talk about sleep apnea before we go to talk about insomnia, where there's a, fa a very fascinating issue about consciousness. Uh, sleep apnea is an illness in which people stop breathing during their sleep. And there's two forms of it, an obstructive form where the upper airway closes off, and that's why they can't breathe. And there's a central form where the, during sleep, the brain forgets to send messages to the body to breathe. Uh, that's pretty forgetful, I would say. Uh, to represent that, I just wanted to show you a, a sleep study. And then normally, in a sleep study, you, uh, you measure not only the things we talked about before, but measures of respiration. And one of those is seeing airflow from the nose and mouth. And, you can see on that top channel that uh, 
normally a person breathes. Air is moving in and out. If you measure their chest wall, uh, which is the next line down, obviously during sleep the chest expands and contracts, causing a person to breathe in and out. The amount of oxygen in their blood is very high, which is that red straight line. And the chest and the diaphragm and the tummy both are moving together in synchrony. The problem is that when somebody has obstructive sleep apnea, that system falls apart. So you can see on the top channel, they're breathing in and out, and then for a period of 30 seconds or 60 seconds, there's no air moving from their nose, and that's that straight line in the middle of the top channel. Uh, now, even though there's no air moving, because the throat is blocked, the chest is trying to move air. So the thoracic strain gauges show the chest heroically trying to suck air past this obstruction. And the diaphragm is doing the same thing, all unsuccessfully. And the result is that the blood oxygen drops, and that's that curving line, red line going down, and then later coming up. Now, at some point, the brain has a reflex that cuts in again, causing this obstruction in the throat to clear and causing breathing to go on. In central sleep apnea, the same thing happens, but the only difference is that it's because the brain forgets to send a, a signal to the diaphragm to breathe. Again, blood oxygen drops, and then at some point, a, a reflex causes breathing to start again. Uh, now, sleep apnea is much worse in REM sleep because, as you recall, we talked earlier, in REM sleep, uh, respiration and pulse become very irregular. By the way, there are also very extreme conditions of um, the brain forgetting to send signals to the body to breathe. And one of these is a neurologic condition known as Andine's curse. Uh, you know, going, I'm sorry? Yeah. Say it again. Andine's curse, O-N-D-I-N-E. And it, it's a, a, she was a character in a, in a Greek myth who had that curse placed on her for, by a jealous uh, god. But I'll never forget, uh, the first patient I ever saw with that was a little girl. They tend to be children. And the reason that they found out about her was that she was swimming and she went to the bottom of the pool and just sat there. And of course, eventually people got distressed and went down and rescued her and brought her up. But the interesting part about it is that she was in no distress. She wasn't unhappy. She was just minding her own business because the, the brain did not have that signal saying, hey, you need to breathe. And so that example always, always stuck in my mind. Now, sleep apnea can have loads of effects on the body. It can not only make you sleepy in the daytime, but it can cause your blood pressure to be too high. Uh, it can cause your heart to have funny rhythms. It can cause a kind of heart failure. And one area that, that I've always been very interested in is there are all sorts of psychiatric consequences. Many of these people uh, become very depressed uh, and irritable. Many of them can have memory troubles. Uh, so it's, it's an illness that affects a person's life in many, many different ways. Uh, it sometimes has an anatomic cause, and this is just a picture of a gentleman with a very large tongue due to hypothyroidism who developed sleep apnea due to the very large tongue helping to block the airway. But most of the time, there isn't a one specific bad guy like, like a big tongue. It's instead just a excessive relaxation of the muscles that during sleep that leads to this blockade. Well, our next disorder is insomnia. And uh, Insomnia is a very interesting topic because it's a terribly, terribly common problem, but surprisingly, very few people bring it up to their doctors. And in fact, the people who have long-term chronic insomnia 
about 70% say they've never uh, mentioned it to their doctor. Um, it can be a difficulty going off to sleep, or it can be a difficulty of awakening up during the night. Uh, it can be a problem of feeling that your sleep wasn't refreshed. And usually folks with insomnia have some combination of these, uh, not just one single kind. The single most common kind of insomnia is having awakenings throughout the night, not, not the problem of going off to sleep. Um, it tends to be more frequent in women. Uh, it's more frequent the older you get. Um, there, it, 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 there's some association with socioeconomic status and uh, so that the, the higher your socioeconomic status, the lower your likelihood of insomnia, which, which just proves what I've always suspected, which is that if you have a lot of money that you, you sleep better at night. But, <laughs> Um, it, it's more common in persons who snore, but my own guess is that means they have undiagnosed sleep apnea. And it's very common in the, in the context of people with other health problems at the same time. Now, there can, of course, be a whole lot of different kinds of reasons for having insomnia. Uh, it can be due to medications, there are loads of kind of medicine. Just to give an example, people who take Thyroid hormone can, can have trouble sleeping, people who take asthma medicines and so on. Uh, it can be due to uh, disorders of the body rhythms, and we'll talk about a little bit of that. It can be related to medical illnesses, um, and of course, short-term insomnia can be related to you know a trauma you know, that happened to you, losing a loved one, for instance. We're gonna talk primarily about this one over on your left, primary sleep disorders, uh, which are illnesses truly of sleep. Now, insomnia is like sleep apnea in that it's not just a problem of feeling uncomfortable lying in bed because you can't sleep. It's also a problem uh, that affects people 24 hours a day in loads of different ways. Uh, there, there's decreased ability to learn and retain new stuff. Uh, the quality of life, when it's tested on scales that measure that, is, is lower in insomniacs. Uh, I did a study once that showed that folks who have insomnia are much more likely to use the healthcare system. They have more emergency room visits, more visits to the doctor's office. Uh, more insurance claims and so on in, in, in general. Uh, they're at an increased risk of car accidents. Uh, <coughs> they have a greater number of um, sick days at work. So it's really a, a phenomenon that affects your life all day long. It, it's not just a, a problem of being unhappy because you can't sleep at night. Now. Among the primary sleep disorders is one called persistent psychophysiological insomnia. And these are folks who uh, can't sleep because of the worry about not sleeping. So what happens is usually they'll initially have a transient sleep problem due to any reason, you know, a tri trip or something bad happened or whatnot. But instead of, you know, sort of nature healing it and they go on about life and start to sleep well again, and these people, the sleep disorder takes on a life of its own because they start worrying about it so much. So it's like the Franklin Roosevelt saying about uh, the only thing we have to fear is, is fear itself. And uh, that's dealt with <coughs> with kinds of psychological therapy where you try to get the person not to, to have this persistent worry. Now, the real the reason I wanted to talk about insomnia is on this next slide, and this is what's called subjective insomnia. And in the lab, somebody with subjective insomnia come, comes in saying, you know, it's just terrible, I, I don't sleep a wink, and I, it's ruining my life, I feel terrible all day long because I don't sleep. And you put them to bed in the lab, and they're like this young lady here. They, 
they, they, they close their eyes, they don't move very much, they breathe slowly and quietly, uh, and they, their brain waves, if you measure them, <coughs> show that they're asleep. And eight hours later, when you go to wake them up, they look at you and say, see doctor, I told you I wouldn't sleep at all. So all of the measures of sleep, uh, physiologically, that we know how to do in 2016, show that they're asleep, but in their minds, they're wide awake. And that's why I wanted to bring up uh, subjective insomnia during this consciousness uh, symposium. Uh, I did a bunch of studies on this at one point, and one example of the kind of studies is we were trying to think, see how some commonly used sleeping pills were. And so what we did is we, we had normal folks and insomniacs sleep in our lab, and we would wake them up after they had been clearly asleep for, let's say, 20 minutes. And I'd walk in the room, wake them up, and say, well, what were you doing right before I came in here? And if you did that with a normal person, he'd say, well, Doc, I, I was asleep, of course. <laughs> And if you walked into the room with the insomniac, he, uh, and you say, what, what were you doing before I came in here? He'd say, well, doctor, obviously I was lying here wide awake. Now, both people have brain waves that show they were sleeping, but their experience was entirely different. Now, I added a little twist to the story, and then I gave the insomniacs a sleeping pill and uh, one night and a placebo or a sugar pill on another night. And on the night that I gave them the placebo or sugar pill, when I went into the room, they said, well, I, Doc, I was lying here awake. On the night I gave them the sleeping pill, they said, well, I was sleeping. So what happened is the sleeping pill changed their perception of their consciousness. In both cases, their brain waves showed that they were in stage two sleep. But when the person got a sleeping pill, he firmly believed that he'd been awake. And when he got a sleeping pill, he firmly believed he'd been asleep. So what that says is that one thing that sleep, uh, sleeping pills do is they change your, your perception of your state of consciousness. Uh, this is just to mention that there are other kinds of primary sleep disorders, and this example is periodic limb movement disorder. Uh, and in this disorder, a person is neurologically normal during the daytime, but when he or she goes to sleep, they have the strong kicking movements of their legs. And you can see these uh, as these sort of big black bulges in the, about halfway down the page. And these can occur about every 20 or 30 seconds for episodes that last up to, say, a half hour. And the patient person having them can be uh, unaware that they're having them. But the person sharing the bed with them can be only too aware that they're having them. Uh, nonetheless, the person having them has sleep inter interrupted many times a night because of the kicking movement. So the sense is a sense that sleep was restless and not deep and, and not refreshing in the morning. And that's periodic limb movement disorder. I think the final thing I would just mention is sleep in psychiatric illnesses. And one good example is depression. And again, I bring up depression because uh, it turns out that one aspect of it may be a disorder having to do with REM sleep regulation. And it actually can be treated uh, by depriving a person of REM sleep. And we'll get into that in a minute. But sleep and depression is made up of several features. It's shallow, meaning there's not much slow wave sleep. It's short. It's intense in the sense of uh, Eye movements are, are, are excessive during REM sleep. And it's advanced in the sense that the first REM period occurs earlier in the night than with other folks. And you can see that on this slide here. On the bottom, 
you can see the REM, the red REM periods, uh, the first one occurring about 90 minutes after sleep onset and being kind of short, and then getting longer as the night goes on. And in depression, you can see that the REM starts earlier. So that's known as a short REM latency. It occurs earlier, and the first REM period is much longer. So when this was first discovered in, I guess, the 80s or so, uh, it was very exciting because it was thought to be maybe we finally have a kind of biological marker for depression. It is not just that you diagnose depression by asking somebody how he feels, but there might be some biological thing that we can point to. Well, it turned out that short REM latency is very sensitive for depression, but it's not very specific for depression because it actually can occur in a wide variety of other conditions. And some of these are narcolepsy, where REM sleep occurs very early. Uh, it occurs in what they call secondary depressions, which is the depression you know, following an emotional trauma. Uh, I think one example that was studied a lot was women in the midst of divorce are often, if they don't have a history of depression, that would be considered a secondary depression. And they can have short REM latencies. It can occur during drug withdrawal. Uh, it's seen in anorexia nervosa and other conditions. So the short REM latency turned out not to be a good biological marker of depression. But the reason I wanted to bring up depression to your attention today is it actually turns out that um, if you deprive a person of REM sleep, uh, it's as effective a treatment for depression as giving modern antidepressant medications. So at least one aspect of, REM, of depression may be some kind of disorder in the regulation of, of REMS or dreaming sleep. Now, there are also uh, disorders of the body clock that we'll wind up with. But just to mention a few of them, one interesting one is called phase lag syndrome. And in phase lag syndrome, a person's body clock is shifted later so that they, they can't go to bed until later and then they sleep in in the morning, can't get up earlier. And that can be a very difficult problem just because you have obligations of going to school and work and so on. Uh, so one way of treating it involves uh, the use of shining bright lights at them in the morning that helps reset the body clock. Another very difficult problem is, is irregular sleep-wake pattern. And these are folks who just uh, by lifestyle and sometimes due to neurological reasons uh, sleep irregularly you know, around the clock and up at some times and sleeping at other times. And this is a very common problem in folks with dementia and folks who are institutionalized in general. And it's a very difficult one to treat. Uh, and there are different ways of, of doing it involving the use of lights, sometimes the use of melatonin. But it's a reminder to us that that body clock that we talked about um, has a very powerful influence on sleep. Uh huh. Would you mention getting rid of the REM sleep for depression? Uh huh. How do you do that? Well, there are some. Well, that's a good one. Yeah. Well, uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. Five minutes. Okay. Um, what happens is you have a person in a sleep laboratory, and whenever you see on the polygraph that they're entering REM sleep, you wake them up. Uh, you go into the room or you turn on the light or something. And of course, the more you deprive a person of REM sleep, the more, uh, uh, the more drive they have to have it. So you end up waking up a person many, many times uh, to, to achieve the goal. But you can do it by measuring the REM sleep by their brain waves and waking them up whenever you see them. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about it more during the uh, uh, the question and answer period at the end, but that's the, the basic way. 
Well, just to wind up, there are also, of course, a lot of treatments available. A lot of them are just sort of common sense things that I'll be happy to talk about later uh, during the uh, question and answer. There are, there are um, formal psychological methods of doing it. The most famous one is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And of course, uh, there are uh, different kinds of medications. Uh, the two forms are not opposed to each other, and uh, that is the non-medicine forms and the medicine forms. And in fact, they can often work well together. So uh, I'll tell you, I'd love to do your question, but I've run out of time. But I'll be happy to, to talk to you during the question and answer period later. Uh, if I don't stop, a duck comes down from the ceiling and grabs me by the collar and pulls me away from the, from the podium. So in summary, sleep, sleep is one of the states of consciousness. Uh, some people actually say that it's two states, non-REM and REM sleep, and say that we all have three states, waking, non-REM, and REM. It's governed by a series of complex physiological systems, and sometimes those systems go awry, uh, resulting in sleep disorders. Thanks very much.